The portrayal of Cuba in American media tends to present a negative view of Cuba's government and its people, ignoring the benefits incurred by communism. Cuba's encounter with the Soviet Union before and after the Cuban Revolution prompted the exchange of ideas and mutual support, allowing the new communist Cuban government to explore novel social policy. This gave way to dramatic changes in Cuban society, most notably the increasing presence of Cuban women in various fields previously held exclusively by men. Before the Cuban Revolution, the role of women was largely defined by trends established during the Spanish colonial period. Spanish culture emphasized a patriarchal society where women were severely limited. Social exploitation, domestic violence, and economic inequality in both rural and urban environments was commonplace. It was a society where women could only expect to marry, raise children, or enroll in a convent. Moreover, Cuba had a capitalist government with high levels of social inequality like most Latin American countries at the time. Although the United States became heavily involved in Cuba during the final years of Spanish dominance until the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, few changes took place. According to the Cuban Office of Statistics, in the early 1950s, women only constituted 13% of the workforce, and out of 13% of women who worked, 70% worked as domestic servants. In addition, the rate of literacy for women was only 20% in the years before the revolution. After the revolution, the Cuban government focused on adopting a traditional Marxist approach to feminism. The Communist Manifesto was written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. The Communist Manifesto outlines the goals of communism and the theories it is based upon. Frederick Engels explains that the emancipation of women will only be possible when women can take part in production on a large social scale and domestic work no longer claims anything but an insignificant amount of her time. The Communist Manifesto also details a communist society having an openly legalized community of women and how the present system needs to be abolished in order for women to be liberated from their own narrow roles. Marxist feminism relies on the principle that women have been historically oppressed, but by bringing them into the workforce, they will no longer suffer from oppression. Following this Marxist logic, a transition into the workforce causes a change in culture, therefore stopping the patriarchal tradition because working women will no longer require a male figure to sustain themselves. The Cuban government's transition to communism required the support and guidance of the Soviet Union. During the period before the Cuban Revolution, the Soviets made a number of contacts with Cuba's communists who had a foothold in the government at the time. When the revolution came, the Cuban upper class fled the country, provoking a huge economic brain drain. In addition, the closure of the U.S. markets to Cuban sugar worsened the situation. Seeing Cuba's precarious situation and the opportunity to obtain an ally near the United States, the Soviet Union decided to support Cuba by signing various trade agreements, which became the basis for economic and political exchange between the two nations. More importantly, the Soviet Union demanded that Cuba make certain economic reforms. Just as Cuba reformed its economy to follow the Soviet Union's specifications, Cuba's political order was reformed as well. On the surface, Castro's regime became Marxist-Leninist. Following the same ideology as the Soviet Union fully opened the doors for a strong relationship to form between the two nations. In spite of sanctions and threats from the United States, Cuba managed to sustain its communist government thanks to the economic and political support it received from the Soviet Union. Later, the Soviet Union even provided Cuba military support. Due to the exchange with the Soviet Union, it became clear that Cuba would continue to exist as a communist nation, unleashing a variety of social changes, including those affecting the role of women in society. In order for Cuba to transition into a communist society like the Soviet Union asked and effectively meet their crop goals to sustain themselves, they had to integrate women into the workforce. Fully utilizing all of the population is a key principle to communism. In one of his speeches during 1965, Fidel Castro stresses the economic importance of including women in the workforce by saying, Society has a duty to help women, but at the same time, society helps itself considerably by helping women, because it means more and more hands joining in the production of goods and services for all people. That is to say, women are necessary for the nation's economic development. 
So naturally, Fidel Castro and the leader of the women's rights movement in Cuba, Vilma Espin, decided to create the FMC, also known as the Federation of Cuban Women, in order to integrate women into the workforce and give them a voice in the government. Vilma Espin said that the purpose of the FMC was to unify women and to mobilize them so we could constitute a powerful force that could defend, support, and fight for the revolution. With this in mind, the FMC created educational opportunities, jobs, and help for the most marginalized women, domestic workers, prostitutes, and peasant women. The FMC created more programs to address many problems Cuban women face, most notably the childcare system that is still effective today. At the FMC founding in 1960, Fidel noted that there are women working who have no place to leave their children. There aren't enough children's circles. The state and the municipality can't change this themselves. The revolution is counting on women of Cuba to do this and on the Federation of Cuban Women. The FMC assumed this responsibility and administered the daycare system, which has always been low cost or free. The care is comprehensive. The child is fed, clothed, and receives complete medical attention, including dental treatment, and if necessary, psychiatric services, as well as the initial stages of a scientific education. The job training program not only taught women skills that would help integrate them into the workforce, but gave women a political, ideological education and monthly FMC meetings, which included study circles about history and politics. The FMC encouraged women to volunteer in various health, farming, and education campaigns. The FMC, a grassroots organization, is comprised of 88% of the female population in Cuba and works to implement policy and ensure women have a voice in the Cuban government. Fidel Castro, with the help of the FMC and the rest of the Cuban government, created the Cuban Family Code in 1975, which mandates equality between men and women in relationships. Article 24 states that both spouses are obligated to care for the family they have created. They must participate to the extent of their capacity or possibilities in the running of the home and cooperate so that it will develop in the best possible way. And Article 28 states that both men and women have the duty of helping each other and cooperating in order to make this possible. Both of these articles emphasize that women and men should both work inside and outside the home, not just women working in the home while men do real jobs. The FMC identified the needs of women and promptly responded with innovative solutions, significantly impacting women in rural areas. None of this would have been possible without the support of the Soviet Union and the Marxist ideology shadowing the union between the two nations. Si algo la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas logró, eh, yo insisto que es un logro de la revolución y de la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas, fue precisamente que las mujeres se incorporaran al empleo, esa autonomía económica. Hoy las mujeres no dependen de sus esposos, hoy las mujeres tienen total autonomía. The ideological exchange between the USSR and Cuba has allowed Cuba to overcome deep-set cultural norms that oppress women for decades. Most Cuban women remain thankful to the revolution for the substantial benefits gained, but issues still remain. Although joining the labor force has proved to give women autonomy, it also means women are forced to deal with the responsibilities of their households as well as their jobs. A working woman in Havana explained this paradox in an interview with the Center for Democracy in the Americas. The Cuban revolution has provided good health and education for everyone, including women in other traditionally marginalized sectors of society. Health and education indicators prove this. At the same time, however, the reality of low salaries, the lack of affordable food, the deteriorating housing situation, and other economic shortcomings make life for us women difficult. 